guests with us. You are our honored guests, and we're so grateful uh, that you're here. Bubba is out today. Uh, he has got a pretty bad cold, so keep him in your prayers. Um, we have so much to be thankful for, amen? We have so much to be thankful for, amen? amen. And we're going to learn tonight, I mean tonight, today, hopefully we'll learn tonight as well, but we're going to learn this morning from the lesson, I can't wait as Michael presents it, that we should be so thankful that we live under a better covenant. That we live under a covenant where we don't have to sacrifice animals. Jesus did it once and for all, and he fulfilled it, everything in the law. And I can't wait to hear Michael's lesson this morning. But before we uh, have our prayer, I want to read a scripture. If you would, turn to Psalm 100. Psalm 100, as we think about Thanksgiving, this is a time... We should think about thanksgiving every day of our lives, but this is a psalm of thanksgiving. And I want to read this, and then we will uh, go to God in prayer. Make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with, thank with singing, knowing that the Lord, he is our God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty God, we come before you. You are the one true and living God. You're our creator. You're our sustainer, Father, and our provider. And we're so grateful for all the things that you do, even the things uh, like the ability to breathe air and the air you supply us, Father. We're, we're grateful for these things, Father. We're grateful for our food, clothing, and shelter. But we're so grateful that you had a plan before the foundation of the world to send your son Jesus to die for our sins. We're so grateful that he fulfilled everything written in the law and the prophets. We're so grateful for everything he did and how he showed us who you are by how he lived on this earth and the teachings that he brought from you. We're thankful for the Holy Spirit who inspired the men to pen the, the gospel and all the books of the law and everything that we have, the whole entirety of scripture we're so grateful that you've given a, that to us. Father, we're grateful for the church. We're grateful that we have a family, Father, and pray that you will bless us as we, as a family, as your family, come before you to praise you, Father. Pray that we will have our hearts set on worshiping you, that we will sing with our, the entirety of our being, that we will give you the praise and the honor that you so deserve. Father, thank you for your love, for your grace, and your mercy. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's all sing together. Come, let us all unite to sing. God is love. Let heaven and earth their praises bring. God is love. Let every soul from sin away, each in his heart sweet music make, and sing with us for Jesus' sake, for God is love. God is love. God is love. Turn our night to day, and now 
rejoice to say that God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. How happy is our portion here. God is love. His promises, spirits cheer. God is love. He is our sun and shield by day. Our help, our hope, our strength and stay. He will be with us all the way. Our God is love. God is love. God is love. Come, let us all unite to sing that God is love. As I travel through this pilgrim land, there is a friend who walks with me. Leads me safely through the sinking sand. It is the of Calvary. This would be my prayer, dear Lord, each day to help me do the best I can. For I need thy light to guide me day and night. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour. Through this land, this pilgrim land, by thy saving, hear my plea, my feeble plea, Lord, dear Lord, look down on me when I kneel in prayer, blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Let me travel in the light divine that I may see a blessed way. Keep me that I may be holy, thine and sing redemption song someday. I will be a soldier brave and true and ever firmly a stand. As I onward go and daily meet the full blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour through this land, this pilgrim land, by thy Saving power, hear my plea, my feeble plea. Lord, dear Lord, look down on me when I kneel in prayer. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. When I wander through the valley, Toward the setting of the sun. Lead me safely to the land of rest. If I a crown of life have won. I have put my faith in thee, dear Lord. That I may reach the golden strand. There's no other friend on whom I can depend. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Blessed Jesus, hold my hand. Yes, I need thee every hour. 
Through this land, this pilgrim land, by thy saving power, hear my plea, my people plead. Lord, hear, Lord, look down on me when I kneel in prayer, blessed Jesus. Before we uh, partake of communion together this morning, we'll see number 337. <clears throat> Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim, hallelujah. Scoffing root in my place, condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah! What a Savior! Guilty, vile, and helpless, we spotless lamb of God. Hallelujah, what a Savior. We don't read very, very many words in the Bible before we see uh, man sin. And in the third chapter, there is a promise, promise of Jesus coming. All through the Bible, the word of man's salvation rings loudly. And when you read um, Isaiah 53, and you can put a heading on that and say, Suffering Servant. Jesus came to serve and not to be served. And as we take a few moments this morning, that plan of salvation was put into uh, motion on earth there in the third chapter. Jesus came to die for you and I. Hallelujah, what a Savior. God is love. He loves us all. And from Matthew, account of, uh, of the Last Supper, it says, While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, after Paul recount, uh, 
of the uh, Last Supper, a few verses below that, he says, let a man examine himself to make sure that we are worthy to partake of this feast today. Would you bow with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your love. We thank you so much for Jesus who, was, who loved you and loved us so much that he was willing to do your will and die upon the cross. And Father, as we take this bread this morning, may we reflect upon the body of Christ and, re and let those words echo in our mind and in our hearts. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you and we love you. For this we do pray in Christ's name. Amen. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my body of the covenant which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sin. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the, the precious blood of your Son, Jesus. Father, we're so thankful for what it, what it does for us this day. And as we partake of this cup this morning, may we again remember Jesus' word. Do this in remembrance of me. We thank you and we love you. For in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Shall we stand together while we sing this song before the lesson for Michael this morning, number 23. There is me on the edge of blue, a God concealed from human sight. 
He tilled skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. From dust our God created man, he is a God, the great I am. There was a long, long time ago. A God was the prophet heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. From the our Secure is life from mortal mind. God holds the germ within his hand. Though men may search, they cannot find. For God alone does understand. There is a God. He is alive. From the star God created man, he is our God, the great I am. Our God who sat upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he sin might set man free and evermore with him could live there is a God he is alive in him we live and we survive from the star God created man he is our God Be seated, Michael Bates. I will be reading Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 through 20. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Thank you, Owens. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's so good to see you. Somebody told me a minute ago, well, you're not uh, Brother Jones, but I guess you'll do. So here we are. <laughs> so good to see everybody. I want to commend you. You supported our, our meeting so well last week, and we're very grateful for that. I, I hope you'll look at the inside page of the bulletin. You'll find a, a little thank you there to you and specifically to uh, folks that, that helped all week long, um, even though it's a little different to meet on a Monday night, Tuesday night, uh, but there were people in place to help us and make sure everything went very, very smoothly, and we are so, so very thankful. I'm going to get right into the lesson uh, this morning, but let me, let me mention one thing to you. 
Um, Fred Netterbull is on his way back to Camp Lejeune. He left this morning. It's about a 12, 13 hour drive. And so uh, Marlon might want to jot that down so it'll be remembered on tonight's announcements as well. And when we close out our prayer, our service with prayer today, let's remember his safe travel uh, back as he travels back. He was able to come home for Veterans Day weekend for a few days, and we're thankful for that. But now we pray for his safe return. Um, the passage that was read for us uh, by Owens just a minute ago is a very important passage. I, I hope that we can understand how important it is not only to the first listeners as he's preaching this sermon, Jesus is preaching this sermon. Uh, I hope that we can kind of come away with understanding how bold it was for what Jesus to say and, and how necessary it was. But it doesn't just resonate or shouldn't just resonate with the early listeners, those who were standing there when Jesus spoke these words. The words Jesus spoke about the law and the prophets and the things that follow have so much to do with us today. And so I hope that we have that impression uh, before we leave here uh, this morning. And so right on the heels of you are the light of the world and you are the salt of the earth, it, it's as though Jesus is now turning his attention uh, to things that are just a little bit deeper uh, and, and a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe bolder uh, as he goes through this lesson. And as he's preaching this sermon, just remember, his disciples are right there close. And uh, they're going to be the ones who really need to take this to heart as well as all men who follow Jesus. And so what Jesus begins to say, we've put on our first point, regarding the law and the prophets. He says in verse 17, do not think that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. The law and the prophets were of utmost importance uh, to all Jews. Uh, this was the law, of course, the law of Moses he's referring to, that was really God's law given through Moses as the lawgiver to the Israelite people in the long ago. And as you well know, as you have studied the books of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, uh, Deuteronomy literally means the law again. And so it's a rehearsal of the law that had already been given to them before they enter into the land of Canaan, the land of promise. And so that whole section of scripture is so very vital because it sets God's precedent. This is how you're going to be able to be my people if you keep my commandments. You're to teach these laws diligently to your children, Deuteronomy 6, verse 1 through 5. Uh, they're to be as frontlets before your eyes. Put them on your doorpost. You talk about them, teach your children when you rise up and then when you lay down at night. Uh, all throughout your life, you ought to be rehearsing these laws, these teachings of God. Now, some of the law had to do with things that were moral, okay? Uh, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't steal, and so forth. Some of the parts of the law were what they call ceremonial, all right? So like the feasts and the holidays and the specific things that each family was to do. Uh, some with the Passover, get all the leaven out of the house, okay? That would have been more of a ceremonial thing. Uh, the offerings were more ceremonial. The moral was more how you treat your neighbor and how it was that you were supposed to go about loving uh, your neighbor and not doing any harm to them. A uh, the pretty good little reference to that is in Romans 13, about verse 8 through 11. And if you really love your neighbor, well, you won't commit adultery because you're hurting somebody. You won't steal. Why? Because that's hurting your neighbor and so forth and so on. Now, when you look at the statement of Jesus here, I think it's one that is very overlooked the first few verses of verse 17. He says, do not think that I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. Don't think that. Why would Jesus say those words? 
Were they just a good way to lead into what he wanted to talk about? See, in our study through the chronological life of Jesus on this earth, we've already seen Jesus come face to face with scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, uh, other rabbis, teachers of the law. And sometimes Jesus has said some things that oppose them. How many times already have they criticized Jesus about the keeping of the Sabbath and what you can do on the Sabbath? See, that was all part of the law. Uh, matter of fact, even in the Ten Commandments, remember the Sabbath day, church, and do what? Keep it holy. And so Jesus has taught them more deeply about the Sabbath, okay? He says, I am Lord of the Sabbath, number one. Sabbath was not, uh, man was not made for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath was made for man, okay? And, and so he gives deeper teaching about what was written in the law. And, and so when Jesus says, do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets, it was already being told them by the religious establishment that that man's breaking the law. That man is opposing the law of Moses. All that he does on the Sabbath, the healings and the, his disciples plucking grain. And later you're going to get into whether or not the disciples wash their hands in the ceremonial way before they eat. All of this, okay? They're being told, look, this man, he's, he's breaking the law. When you get into the book of Acts and even the apostles and early disciples who begin practicing Christianity... Many of the Jews that met at the synagogue would criticize them. Why? Because they're not doing things in accordance with the what? The law of Moses. Okay? And so Jesus doesn't want them to think like what his opposition has been telling them. Uh, that do not think I'm come to destroy the law and the prophets. Those were not wasted words, do not think. He's trying to help them understand where he's coming from as opposed to where his critics are coming from. So, the word that is translated, do not think that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets, comes from a Greek word that means to loosen down. Okay? And so, from that definition, in our English translations, you all of a sudden, you're reading along, don't think I've come to destroy well, loosen down and destroy don't really have the same connotation in our minds, does it? Okay? Uh, this word would have been used back in those days when they put up tents in places to hide from the sun and sometimes to live in uh, while they were traveling from place to place. It would mean when you get ready to go again, you begin to loosen down your tent. It could be used if you were tearing down a house. You know, many of them were built with uh, those uh, different uh, roof types, sometimes tiles, sometimes with branches and leaves and things of that nature. Well, it would literally mean to begin to tear those things down. And so you do away with the tent. You pack it away, okay? It's no longer the tent that you had up. You loosened it down so you could move it. Think about how they moved the tabernacle back during the days of Moses. Uh, they were to what? Loosen it down, break it down, so that it was not standing as it was. And so the idea here is Jesus is saying, look, I didn't come to loosen down the law, but I'm not taking it down. I'm not abolishing that law in that sense. I, I've done something, and I'm doing something different. The two terms that Jesus used, abolish or destroy, is translated in our English translation, I've not come to destroy, but to do what? Fulfill. That Greek word <laughs> is so very <laughs> uh, definitive of our English word, it literally means to feel full. Okay? In other words, fill something up to the point that it is full. All right? Now, in the law, Deuteronomy 18 would be one instance. Moses would write, inspired of the Holy Spirit, that eventually there was going to arise one like Moses, a prophet like Moses, and he's going to come from among you, you Israelite people, and that is the one one day that you are to hear and to follow. In Acts chapter 3, about verse 19 and following, Peter 
preaching about Jesus refers to that passage in the law and says Jesus is the fulfillment of that particular prophecy. There were prophecies about Jesus in the law of Moses, and there were others. When you look at the prophets, that's also mentioned here. I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, but I came to fulfill. Well, the prophets are filled with prophecies foretelling things about the coming of Jesus. You know, you think about Isaiah 7 and verse 14. He'll be born of a virgin, okay? Micah 5, 2. He'll be born in where? Bethlehem of Judea. As lowly a place as that was, that's where our Lord would be born, okay? Uh, Psalm 22, about how the Messiah, the one sent from God, would be a suffering servant, just like Mr. Danny said about Isaiah 53 in our uh, Lord's Supper thoughts. Uh, you think about uh, Psalm 16. Well, that prophesies the resurrection of Jesus. And so on and on we go, whether you're talking about the law of Moses itself or where you're talking about the writing prophets. Well, Jesus is saying, I'm not here to destroy that. I'm not here to loosen it down and just do away with it for no good reason. What he's saying, or, or, or at all, he's saying, I've come to fulfill it. Everything the law and the prophets spoke of was about me. Later on, as Jesus in his ministry talks with the Pharisees and the scribes and the chief priests, he's going to talk about the things that Moses and the prophets wrote about concerning me. He'll tell his own disciples when they talked about the fact that I'm going to die and be raised from the dead again, they were talking about me. I am the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. They've all been pointing to me. Okay? And I am going to fulfill all that was spoken about me. Now, they didn't get it at this point. But Jesus also has in mind, I'm going to fulfill those prophecies even when it comes to giving my body to be beaten and humiliated and mocked and nailed to a cross I'm going to fulfill what was spoken about me even to that extent that's what Jesus has in mind now let me ask you something once something is fulfilled what do you do with it if you were to say today I have fulfilled a certain obligation do you still owe yourself or anyone else to do that obligation anymore whatever it was no you take out a loan at the bank and eventually you finally make that last payment have you fulfilled your obligation to that note that you took out at the bank yes you're going to send them another payment next month I, I don't know if anybody's ever done that now, I don't work at a bank though I mean maybe it does but it just doesn't seem right so when something has been fulfilled then it is no longer what? It's no longer in effect anymore. It's no longer the way things are. Now you are freed from that thing that's been fulfilled. On the back of your sermon page for your daily devotion, I have given you New Testament passages. Some of them may be a chapter long to read because for this sermon today, we don't have time to get into all of those specifics. But they show that when Jesus came and died on the cross and was raised from the dead and the church was established, it shows that Jesus took that old law and he nailed it to his what? His cross. It died with him. He fulfilled it. And so there's no more need for that law. You're going to read those other passages, though, that that was a part of the old covenant that God had made with Israel. But then you're going to see how the old covenant is now contrasted with the new covenant in Jesus Christ. Folks, that's why we don't sacrifice animals anymore. Okay? That's why the remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Well, that would have been the seventh day for them. Well, we, we will do that anymore. Why? Jesus took that old law and he nailed it to the cross. Okay? He, he crucified it. It has been fulfilled. 
And so now we serve God through the New Testament, the New Covenant of Jesus Christ. But Jesus wanted his listeners and us to understand something else. He says, until it is fulfilled, not one jot, which would have been the smallest of the Hebrew letters, not one tittle, a very small mark or a hook. You might think of it as uh, uh, when a, a word is hyphenated or sometimes just a little mark uh, like an apostrophe or something, a breath sound in the Hebrew, okay? The smallest of those things that were in the law and the prophets, heaven and earth is not going to pass away until those things are fulfilled. Even the smallest details. So that's how much I'm not here to loosen down. I'm not here to tear down. I'm not here to abolish the law in that sense. But I'm here to fulfill it all the way down to the smallest details. Everything will be fulfilled. And then he says at the end, till all is fulfilled. Now, if that makes sense, shake your head this way. Okay? If I need to say it again, shake your head this way. Okay. Did I see it? Oh, just kidding. All right, here we go. Number two. Then Jesus gets into the practice and the teaching of that law. And as I mentioned in our Bible class today... The way Jesus words this, and I want you to look very carefully with me. Come down to verse uh, number 19. He says, Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so. So what came first? The practice of it in these words or the teaching of it? It was the practice of it. You broke the law. Okay? If you do that, you shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does, that is the teachings, these commandments, and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, in the mind of Jesus, the action should come before the teaching. What makes a person a great rabbi to them or a great teacher is one that by their life they have demonstrated the things that they will later teach. In Acts chapter 1, for instance, Luke He's writing to Theophilus again. And in Acts, he's referring to the first thing that he wrote to Theophilus. And that's the gospel of Luke. That was all about Jesus. And so now as he gets to Acts, he refers back to that book of Luke and says the former treatise that I've already written to you of all that Jesus began both to do and to what? Teach. And so in that culture and in the mind of Almighty God and, and Jesus Christ here, it's the idea that you do and then you teach. Okay? Now there is a reason that Jesus is specific to word it that way here. And we're going to get to that reason in just a moment. And so what he's saying here is don't break the law yourself. And then don't teach others to do the same. There were some among them, the ones who have already opposed Jesus and who would later oppose Jesus. That had been their practice. Their practice had been that they break the commandments themselves for their own traditions. They'll hold their traditions as being the law of God, which they weren't. But then they turn around by it and break the commandment. Mark chapter 7, Matthew chapter 15. Okay? And then they turn around and they teach others to do the same. Oh, uphold these traditions. Oh, well, if the law of God says this, you know, we have to uphold our tradition. Okay? And so we'll break the commandment of God in doing so. But then he says, but those will be least in the kingdom. That's not a, necessarily a, a good place to be. So do what the law says. That's the way to do it. And teach others to do what the law says. And then that person will be great in the kingdom of heaven. Okay? Not going to spend as much time on this slide. But the idea is you got to practice what you preach. And, and the first thing is practice it, then preach it. 
then people will know that it is authentic, that you are authentic. You're not trying to lead them down some road you're not willing to go. Okay? Do you believe Jesus lived what he preached? When he told people, if you're going to come after me, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. Did Jesus do those things? He did, didn't he? And so Jesus says, your religious leaders, they're not practicing what they're preaching, and they're breaking the commandments. They're teaching you to do that, and that is not the right way. And then thirdly, we come down, I think it is verse number 20. For I say to you, that means everything that he has just laid out, there was a reason for it. Instead of therefore, it's just simply for. So what he's about to say is based on all of those principles that he has just laid down. And he says, for I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, I said earlier in the introduction that what Jesus said here was very, very bold. Very, very bold. And it is. Because there is great risk that, hey, this will be carried back to some of those scribes and Pharisees, and they're going to be hotter than they were before at Jesus. Okay? Jesus, Son of God, He's going to tell the truth regardless. And those who were misleading God's people, He was there to correct and call out their error. Okay? And so, hey, Jesus would later say in Matthew 23 and verse number 3 that these same scribes and Pharisees, they say and they do not do. He'll go on in Matthew 23 to say they bind all these heavy burdens on all of you, but they wouldn't try to lift them with one of their little, they're not even going to give it a little bit of effort to do what they tell you to do. And so Jesus says that, that, that's one of their great fallacies. And in, in that chapter, he lists many more. So they are the ones that fall in that first category. Not only do they break the commandment themselves, but they also teach others to do the same. The word exceed in, in uh, Matthew 5 and verse 20, it lets your righteousness exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. That word exceed would be used talking about a river during the rainy season that had overflowed its banks. Way too much water for what the, the river would hold and what its banks would hold. And so when you're talking about something excessive, well, that would be an excessive amount of water, right? So it overflows its banks. And so in essence, what Jesus is saying is you have to be better than your rabbis. Now I wonder what some of those <laughs> what some of those listeners thought about that. You have to be better than your teachers. I've just pointed out the weakness of your teachers. You have to be better than that if you're going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. And, and I imagine some of these folks, well, well, they held a lot of these teachers in boy high esteem. Yeah, you mean my rabbi's been misleading me? That's one thing we miss in this passage, right? <laughs> you, you mean that religious man who wears all them robes and, and, and has all these phylacteries, attachments, where he can just pull out pieces of the law and read them to anybody, anytime? You, you mean that guy? You, you mean he's not telling me right? You mean he's breaking the commandments? You mean he's telling me to do the same? And in essence, Jesus is saying yes. And your righteousness has to exceed that. And then Jesus goes on and he addresses their teaching. This is kind of looking into the next couple of weeks of, of less. Their teaching in Matthew 5, 21 through 48. He's going to tell them that, yes, yeah, so they tell you right. The law does say not to murder. Thou shalt not murder. But then Jesus Here's another way in which he is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He fills it full. He says, look, don't even be angry with your brother. 
you have a problem with them, you get it worked out on the way. As a matter of fact, if you go to worship and you find out your brother has something against you, you leave your gift at the altar and you go take care of that. Because Jesus knows that that anger leads to hatred, leads to murder. He'd later say what? You've heard that it's been said, don't commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks upon a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already where, church? In his heart. See, Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, not just because he fulfills all the prophecies, but he is able to live and to teach what the heart behind those laws were about to begin with. You know, it's one thing not to murder. A lot of those could walk around and say, oh, I never killed anybody. I never took a man's life. And up there, God's thinking, yeah, but you sure were mad at him for a long time, and you never worked it out. Somebody may strut around and say, huh, yeah, law, God told me don't ever commit adultery. But you know, I, I sure do lust after them pretty women, even if they're married. don't matter to me. But I hadn't committed adultery now. And Jesus says, God from heaven knows what? You've already done that where? In your heart. See, he gets down to where it all begins, what the purpose of all of it was. And they had turned the system of religion God had given them into just a, relig just, just a ritualistic practice, going through the motions, no heart in it, offering the terrible sacrifices, the sickly, the weak, the ones that weren't going to make, instead of giving God their best. See, the way they treated their neighbor, it's okay to harbor all this animosity here just as long as I don't act out on it. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not the way. you got to change this first. It's from here out, not from out here in. This is what needs to be changed. And so... In chapter 6, he'll begin addressing some of those Pharisaic practices. Don't, and I'm only mentioning these, because I don't want you to think that these are disconnected from one another. When Jesus said what he said here about exceeding the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, he's pointing out in the next couple of chapters what, what it is that is so wrong with their view. Here are these Pharisees, when they do their alms, when they give to the poor, they got to make sure everybody's looking. They blow a trumpet. Hey, look at me. Look at the good I'm doing. Is that what the Lord wanted? Well, to help the poor, yes. But to make it about you, no. Make these long prayers. Stand out in the open. Make sure everybody sees and hear. Oh, look what a good religious guy that is. No. Pray to God, yes. Do it so it's about you, no. It all goes back to the heart. And so I hope the next time we read these verses that I didn't come to destroy or loosen down the law and the prophets, but to fulfill, maybe there's some thoughts that will come to our mind that we didn't have before. And just how deep and far-reaching this particular passage is. If there's anybody here that needs to obey the gospel of Christ, we're ready to assist you. If you need to repent of your sins, confess Christ, your faith in him, because you've heard the gospel and you believe, we hope you'll come put Christ on in baptism today and be a new person when you leave here. If there's somebody that as a Christian, you've got some struggles in your life and you just want to come to Jesus, you need to come to Jesus. And let your church family surround you with love and help and support. We invite you to come now as we stand and as we sing.
seated. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in Him. It's this time we'll offer the prayer for our contribution for what we have been blessed with in our life and all. Uh, Plates are located up, uh, up front and also at the exits at the back. Uh, I want to read from 1 Corinthians 16, verse 1 and 2. It says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the church at Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save as he is prospered, so that there be no collection be made when I come. First day of the week, we collect attitude of your contribution. You can read from there in Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse seven. Would you bow with me, please? Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. You have blessed us again and again and again. And at this time, Father, as we return a portion of that blessing to you, may it, we do it with a cheerful and joyful heart. Father, we thank you and we love you. For this we do pray in Christ's name. Amen. Good morning.
I'd like to remind everyone, if you will, uh, take a worship bulletin home with you. They're full of announcements. We won't go over all of them, but we do have some additions that I would like to add to these this morning. First of all, Jimmy Anthony Sr. is in the hospital uh, due to sepsis. Let's please remember uh, him. Uh, Jim Baranowski uh, began another round of treatments on Thursday. Continue to remember him during this time and his family. Uh, Curtis Bobo is recovering at home. Also asking for prayers for recovery uh, and the next surgery. Shun Nunley is a teen friend from camp, is in the hospital and needs prayers. Of course, Brother Dickerson as well during um, this time that he is continually getting better and we're thankful for that. Uh, as Michael mentioned, Fred Netterville, we'll mention that again tonight, is back uh, in route and we appreciate his service uh, and we're praying for his safety. And I know that uh, Howard and Allison appreciate that uh, as well. Be a Barnabas this week. Uh, please send a note, a call, or a text to William Norris. Uh, and those mean so much from an encouragement standpoint. Thanksgiving potluck is tonight after our services. So as always, please bring enough for your family and then our guests as well. And if you see somebody that's visiting you today, please remind them to come and, and we'll cover the food for them. Uh, Crystal Baird and Kathy Lott are collecting money for our Christmas Benevolence Program. Please give your donations directly to them no later than next Sunday, November the 19th. So it's a great work that we're doing here. I mentioned the potluck uh, Thanksgiving is for tonight, but when we're looking ahead to that week, Thanksgiving week, our Bible study, please make note and make sure everybody else knows as well. Uh, we will be meeting on Tuesday night instead of Wednesday night, November the 21st, and there will be no classes during that time. We'll have our service here together in the auditorium. Snack next Sunday after evening worship. Dinner will be provided, so parents make note of that as well. If you'd like to give towards the minister's Christmas gifts, we're starting to do that today, so please uh, give whatever money you would like to donate towards that to one of the deacons, uh, and we'll make sure that gets uh, to the proper allotment. Uh, tonight at 6 is the next time we'll be together, Lord willing, and then that potluck afterwards. So I'll ask you to be standing. Johnny will have one more song, and then Luke Kynell will have our closing prayer. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word, dearer far than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless. Here the great example is empowered for me. Where he leads, i follow, follow all the way. Where he leads, i follow, follow Jesus every day. To his loving words, come unto me. Weary, heavy laden, there is sweet rest for thee. Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior and thy soul secure. Where he leads, I'll follow, follow. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for all that you've given us. Thank you for allowing us this opportunity to come out and worship you this morning. Thank you for the wonderful lesson that we've heard and for sending Christ to fulfill the law. Uh, thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. Please be with Fred as he travels back and all the all the veterans that have uh, so proudly served our country and what they mean for us and, and what they've done for us. Uh, please be with all those that are mentioned that are sick and dealing with uh, physical ailments. Please forgive us of all our many sins and help us to have safe travels and return back tonight at the appointed time. In Christ's name.